Good evening, uh, good morning, depending on wherever you're logging in from. Uh, please give us a couple of minutes for everybody to join in, um, and then we'll start the webinar. While people are entering, just a quick uh, note on logistics. All the attendees, please take note that uh, at any time during the webinar, you will be able to uh, click on the Q&A button and ask any questions that you wish uh, to the panelists. The panelists will be able to see these questions. And if you have um, any technical issues, you have our email and you can write to us and we'll try to sort that out for you quickly. Um, and once again, thank you for joining us today. Just give us a minute and then we'll start the event. Okay, um, I think more people are joining, but we're good to go. Once again, good evening and good morning. Thank you for joining us today for the ICDR Young and International webinar on Japan, Asia update, recent developments in international arbitration and dispute resolution. My name is Smriti Ramesh and I am with the AAA ICDR Asia Case Management Center in Singapore. Before I turn this session over to our fantastic panel here today, please allow me a few minutes to quickly talk to you about the YNI, Asia CMC, and the ICDR. Now, the ICDR YNI is a networking group for arbitration and young practitioners under the age of 40. It operates on a global and regional basis uh, and has some fantastic people. In fact, our presence in Asia is getting pretty strong. We presently have four members on either our executive or our global advisory board from Asia, including one of our panelists today, uh, Anne-Marie. ICDR YNI hosts a lot of events and all the events on capacity building are available on our website. Uh, you will also have the ICDR membership form for those young practitioners who would like to become members. And if you have any issues, you can always write to us. On that note, uh, for us here at the Asia Case Management Center, we're very pleased not just with the topic today, but also the interest in Asia, especially from young practitioners. The ICDR has had its presence in Singapore for over 11 years, but recently in 2019, it set up its expanded and fully functional case management center uh, only because um, even in a, our caseload has been steadily increasing over the years with 2018 seeing as many as 200 parties from Asia. Uh, cases are uh, stakeholders include people from uh, Singapore, India, China and uh, Japan and other Asian countries. Similarly, we also host a lot of capacity building events tailored for Asia and the Asian region. So if there's something of interest, please do check out our page for our upcoming events, including um, a virtual workshop for remote hearings that's coming up later this month. Now, today's session is very exciting in that it includes updates to the rules in Japan JCAA, amendments to the Arbitration Act in Japan, and also a lot of information on the Singapore Arbitration Act. Not just is it relevant and topical, it's also exciting for us at the ICDR because we are also in the process of amending our rules to include many interesting changes, which while we can't share all of that yet. I'm looking forward to having a session where we talk to you about our upcoming rules and changes. Well, with this, I won't take up more of your time because uh, the session that you have planned today promises to be exciting and informative. So I'm happy to turn this over to our moderators for the day, Anne-Marie and Erico. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Smriti, and thank you ICDR and ICDR Young and International um, for hosting this webinar tonight. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone and Happy New Year um, from our panelists and myself. 
uh, we hope everyone has been safe and are delighted to kick off this new year with an update on Japan's and Asia's recent efforts to promote international arbitration and DR in the region. Um, as Smriti said, for tonight, we have prepared some hopefully very interesting topics. So we'll start with uh, Japan's main arbitral institution, the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association or JCAA and its recent work. Um, we then plan to continue with developments in Japanese and uh, Singaporean mediation and conclude with amendments on the Japanese and Singaporean Arbitration Act, as well as legislations on to practice as a foreign lawyer in Japan. So before we start, um, could I ask the audience to briefly participate in a poll we have prepared? Um, it should show in the, on the screen in short. Oh, there it is. So my co-panelists and I would be very interested to know how much experience the audience has in the Japanese and Asian arbitration environment and market. So please choose from one of the four possible answers. So no prior experience, a little substantial and Japan Asia specialist. Thank you. We'll give it a few seconds. Right, this is very interesting. So we have 46% no prior experience, almost half of the audience, then followed by some substantial and the least of us have Japan, Asia, or Japan, Asia specialists. Thank you very much. That's very good to know and very interesting to know. So now bearing this poll in mind, um, I'm very happy to present to, to you all um, our speakers for tonight all successful female arbitration practitioners. And I'll begin with Ms. Hiroko Nihei. She's counsel at O'Melveny and Myers based in Tokyo. Her focus is in, on international commercial arbitration, cross-border DR, uh, including Japanese and US litigation, antitrust investigations, and especially contentious IP cases. She's admitted in Japan, is trilingual, speaks Japanese, English, and German, and was raised in Europe and both educated in Japan and Europe or England, sorry. She features on the list of arbitrators um, of the JCAA and WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center. And apart from her work as a counsel, she also serves as a PR officer at the JCAA in Tokyo. So she brings with her not only considerable experience as a counsel, but also from the institutional perspective. Now, moving on to our second guest speaker for tonight is Ms. Azusa Saito, counsel at Nishimura and Asahi, DR group. She's based in New York and has previously worked for several years in our Tokyo office. So thank you Saito Sensor for joining so early in your morning. And uh, she focuses on commercial arbitration, complex commercial litigation involving pharmaceutical, um, automobile construction and telecommunications industries. She's admitted in Japan and New York. And as Ms. Nihei Saito-sensei um, has substantial experience in institutional work, um, having been deputy secretary uh, at the JAA, so the Japan, Japan Arbitration Association for four years. And last but not least, we have Ms. Alex Buhel, um, Managing Associate at Linklaters in Singapore. Uh, Ms. Uhel is a is specialist in cross-border commercial arbitration and DR investigations and regulatory compliance. She is admitted in Paris and New York and chairs the Linklaters CSR Committee in Singapore and is also very much involved in legal technology in innovation. So she co-founded the first so-called legal tech incubator in France and was endorsed by the Paris Bar Council. Uh, I'm sure that if the audience ha is interested, uh, Ms. Uhel is able to provide more background on this fascinating project. So please go ahead. And now to my co-moderator, Ms. Eriko Kadota. She's an associate at Linklaters in Tokyo and admitted in Australia, New South Wales, Wales, a foreign registered lawyer in Japan, um, 
for a Japanese Gaikoku Hojimu Bengoshi. Uh, we will discuss what this involves in more detail later on. Her practice involves international arbitration, litigation, and investigations across a range of jurisdictions and sectors. She's also a committee member of the Young Japan Association Arbitrators of Arbitrators, so the YJAA. Um, and I would like to now um, introduce my co-moderator, Anne-Marie uh, Dronenberg. So um, Anne-Marie is an associate based in the Tokyo office of Nishimura Nasahi, and she specializes in commercial and investor state arbitration, as well as cross-border dispute resolution. Um, she's admitted in Germany and in England and Wales, and she has also just registered as a, a foreign registered lawyer in Japan. Uh, before moving to Japan, she worked in the US and in several European jurisdictions, um, so we have quite a range of experience on the panel today. Um, and as well as Anihei Sensei, Anne-Marie has a trilingual family background. And um, as Smithri um, mentioned, she's a member of the ICDR Young and International Global Advisory Board. Thank you very much, Eriko. So um, shall we now turn to our first panel? Uh, Ms. Nihei, uh, the last couple of years were landmark years for Japan's arbitration. Uh, with the opening of different hearing facilities across Japan and the work by the JCAA. Um, could you briefly explain what are the key initiatives implemented by the government of Japan in cooperation with arbitral and mediation centers and institutions in connection with hearing facilities? First of all, um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and I'm very delighted to be here tonight. So in 2017, uh, the Japanese government uh, made a firm decision to promote international arbitration and turn Japan into an international arbitration hub. In order to achieve its goal, the government decided to uh, provide world-class hearing facilities in Japan to allay the concerns among arbitration practitioners uh, for the lack of a specialized local venue. So in 2018, the Japan International Dispute Resolution Center called JIDRC opened its first hearing facility in Osaka, followed by another uh, brand, new, brand new hearing facility in Tokyo in 2020. And both of them are equipped with uh, state-of-the-art facilities for arbitration. And the facilities are available for hearings in ad hoc arbitrations, as well as institutional arbitrations administered by any arbitration institutions under the same attractive conditions. On the institutional side, uh, in 2018, two new ADR institutions were established in Japan. The International Arbitration Center in Tokyo, uh, called IACT, is a Tokyo-based international arbitration institution focusing on intellectual property dispute resolution. The list of arbitrators consists of globally respected IP judges from leading jurisdictions, including the United States, Europe, China, Korea, and Japan. The, the Japan International Mediation Center, called JIMC Kyoto, is a Kyoto-based international mediation institution. A unique feature of the mediation at JIMC Kyoto is to provide an option to do mediation at a historical temple in Kyoto, which will offer a special atmosphere to facilitate a settlement. Thank you. So um, linked to this, what um, has the JCAA in particular been actively involved um, in terms of innovations? You should be an expert on that as well. Thank you. Uh, so let me wear my hat as the public relations officer of JCAA. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Japanese ADR institutions, uh, JCAA is the oldest uh, arbitration and in, uh, mediation institution in Japan. So let me share my slides first. Okay. 
So since 2018, uh, JCAA has been pushing forward reforms to promote JCAA arbitration and mediation by improving user satisfaction. Um, as part of the reform, JCAA amended its existing rules and uh, established one new set of rules and now offers three sets of rules that accommodate diverse needs in the business community. So the first option is the ancestral arbitration rules supplemented by JCAA's administrative rules for ancestral arbitration. These are suited for companies with extensive experience in international arbitration who prefers a flexible and high quality arbitration by a world renowned arbitrator. The administrative rules for ancestral arbitration provide only the minimum administrative provisions. And the second option is the commercial arbitration rules. These are the standard arbitration rules that adapt the global standard and are suitable for any business users in any jurisdiction. And the third option is the interactive arbitration rules. The interactive arbitration rules are a brand new set of unique rules which offer maximum predictability and efficiency, which I will talk a little bit more later. These are ideal for companies who are less experienced in international arbitration and tend to have hesitation to use arbitration. And aside from the rules, uh, JCAA launched a new bilingual website last year, which contains many useful information, including uh, arbitration and mediation rules, uh, model clauses, statistics, and publications. If you're interested in JCAA, uh, please do visit this new website. Thank you, Nihei Sensei. Um, in terms of uh, the case load over the years, um, how has, have the cases um, increased uh, over the years? Have you seen an increase? Uh, the answer is yes, and I will share another slide. So, um, as you can see, uh, JCAA saw an unfortunate decline in arbitration caseload after 2016, but the number of new cases uh, recovered in 2020 to the same level as 2016. So, JCAA hopes to see an upward trend going forward. Yeah, so we can see, especially after the 2019 rules amendment, there has been an increase. That's good to know. Um, staying with the rules amendments, um, one of the key changes you already introduced was were the brand new interactive rules. And they were designed to offer uh, predictability and uh, efficiency. Um, and JCAA actually promotes them for being or adopting a more civil law approach. What are the key features of the interactive rules and where did the JCA look for inspiration when drafting them? So the interactive arbitration rules are unique in that uh, they reflect the voices from the businesses. So JCAA listened to the honest opinions of more than 40 companies and we learned that, that, uh, we learned that um, they are not satisfied with unpredictable and lengthy process in a costly arbitration, resulting from placing strong emphasis on party autonomy. Although uh, this is the currently prevailing method of conducting arbitration, uh, JCAA recognized that there are users who are not content with it. So to provide a solution to the frustrated users, JCAA designed the interactive arbitration rules to require the arbitral tribunal to interact with the parties on two occasions during the arbitration proceeding. The first interaction takes place at an early stage of the proceeding. And the arbitral tribunal must present to the parties a written summary of fact uh, of each party's positions on factual and legal grounds of the claim and defense and provide the parties with an opportunity to comment. The second interaction takes place before an evidentiary hearing. The arbitral tribunal must provide the parties with a written summary of factual and legal issues that the tribunal considers important 
and the tribunal's preliminary view on those issues. The tribunal will then give the parties an opportunity to comment. Through these two dialogues, uh, the parties are kept apprised of the status and they can tailor their strategies according to the preliminary feedback from the arbitral tribunal. So JCAA believes that the dispute resolution process will become efficient because the parties are able to concentrate on important issues. Thank you. Um, very active role indeed uh, of the tribunal. And now, um, now that just over two years have passed since the introduction of the rules, um, have there been any arbitrations initiate, initiated under these rules? Yes, uh, one case was commenced under the interactive arbitration rules last year, and that case is still ongoing. So JCAA cannot provide details of that case, but I can share some information today. So the case relates to an alleged product defect concerning a sales agreement between parties from civil law jurisdictions. The parties agreed to submit the dispute to JCAA arbitration under the interactive arbitration rules after the dispute has arisen. And the case is currently heard by a three arbitrator tribunal. And that's all that I can share at this moment. Thank you. Now, very interesting to know, and, and hopefully this will develop in the near future. Um, just briefly on the second set of rules, which were also amended, the commercial rules, um, they originate from the 2014 version and were already designed as a very modern framework. So they covered um, proceedings with multiple parties, emergency arbitration and expedited arbitrations. Um, the 2019 amendments incorporate certain changes uh, for selected issues. So, for example, to further improve time um, efficiency and protect awards from challenges and to lower costs. So, uh, in terms of these commercial rules, what were the key changes? So JCAA's commercial arbitration rules have been carefully crafted to prevent procedural disputes arising from the differences of the party's legal background. For instance, uh, the commercial arbitration rules have an explicit provision on tribunal secretaries. So as everyone knows, uh, tribunal secretaries are commonly used by busy arbitrators, but they are positions and obligations have not been entirely clear, at least for companies who are not familiar with arbitration. Therefore, JCAA's rules provide that before the appointment of tribunal secretaries, arbitrators must obtain parties' written consent after providing the parties with certain information. The rules also stipulate that no arbitrator shall delegate at delegate um, to the tribunal secretaries tasks that substantially influence the arbitrator's decision and that tribunal secretaries are bound by the same obligation to remain independent and impartial and to maintain confidentiality as the arbitrators. Another example would be the prohibition of disclosing dissenting opinions. Unlike judgments resulting from litigations, uh, whether a dissenting opinion can be disclosed um, is an unsettled issue in international arbitration. To clarify this point, uh, JCAA's rules explicitly prohibit arbitral tribunals from disclosing dissenting or individual opinions. But these are just some of the examples. Thank you very much. Very innovative and, and interesting changes. So, yeah. Hopefully some comments or questions will come later. Um, so in the recent proceedings, have any of these amendments uh, become recently relevant? Yes. Um, so for example, uh, under the commercial arbitration rules, uh, ex parte communication between party appointed arbitrator and the appointing party is allowed only if all parties agree to it in writing. 
And in, in a recent case, uh, a, a party appointed arbitrator wanted to discuss the selection of the chairman with the appointing party. And therefore, um, he, uh, they obtained consent uh, they, uh, he obtained consent from all parties in advance as required by the commercial arbitration rules. Also, um, under the commercial arbitration rules, the hourly rate for an arbitrator is 50,000 Japanese yen, which is equivalent to 480 US dollars, unless the parties agree otherwise. Initially, uh, there were concerns as to whether um, first class arbitrators would agree to this rate. But in the two, past two years, uh, default hourly rate was accepted in all cases, except for one case in which the hourly rate was increased by agreement. I want to also add that the appointed arbitrators include those from the United States, England, Australia, Austria, Canada, Singapore, Hong Kong, India, and China. So it was not only Japanese arbitrators who agreed to this default uh, hourly rate. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Nihei Sensei. So that would be more in the rules, um, from the rules perspective. A uh, question on the um, uh, virtual hearings, which are ri rising in this COVID era. Um, have you, um, has the JCAA seen an increase um, and, um, in virtual hearings or is it rather suspending proceedings? Um, how is it dealing with the situation? JCAA went virtual as well. Um, JCAA's routes uh, explicitly allow electronic submissions, uh, web conferences and virtual hearings. Therefore, JCAA's arbitration and mediation procedures have not been affected by COVID-19. Um, all of the cases in 2020 were conducted online. To give you some uh, statistics, uh, in 2020, uh, six days of procedural uh, conferences, uh, 10 days of evidentiary hearings, and one day of non-evidentiary hearings were conducted virtually uh, using Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Thank you. I see everyone is going virtual nowadays, and um, hopefully we'll have some more um, events on that soon, and you can pick up in the future. Um, that concludes the first panel. I'll pass on to Alex and um, Erico. Thanks, Anne-Marie. So we'll be moving on to mediation next. And what we've seen um, in the last couple of years is an increase in mediation cases. And we heard from the Singapore International Mediation Center that they have received over 130 cases since it launched in 2014. And last year it hit a record high of 43 cases compared to 23 in 2019. So I guess similar to the JCAA, there's been sort of an increase in cases being filed in the last year or so. And also uh, the other big news for mediation is of course the Singapore Convention on Mediation that entered into force in September 2020. Um, so before we sort of launch into the nitty gritty of mediation, um, Alex, could you briefly outline the benefits of mediation in general? Sure, thanks Eriko. Uh, well, so mediation is, is you know, one of the most uh, popular forms of, of alternative dispute resolution. Uh, it takes the form of a formal negotiation assisted by a neutral individual, the mediator, who guides the negotiation process and helps the parties to arrive at the settlement. Unless and until a, a formal settlement has been entered into, a mediation is non-binding. So it's a consensual process and, and either party can walk away from the process at any time. The advantages of mediation compared to more formal forms of dispute resolution include the fact that the process is flexible, so the parties can settle their dispute in any way they see fit, rather than uh, being confined to the relief that the court or a tribunal is able to order. It can also help the parties to preserve an ongoing commercial relationship, something that is particularly important in the long-term contractual situations. Um, second, I would say the process is confidential. So discussions with the mediator are private and confidential. 
any offers or concessions made in the mediation are without prejudice. They cannot be re revealed by the other side in later proceedings in court. A good mediator will uh, also be able to introduce new way of, of resolving disputes that the party may not have uh, considered. And the, the, the fact that the parties have gone through the trouble of arranging the mediation means generally that they are more likely to enter into negotiations with the view to, to, to settle. And actually settlement rates are quite high. So out of 10 mediations administrated by the Singapore International Mediation Center, seven or eight cases reach a settlement. And in many cases, mediation can, can also be quicker and cheaper than court or arbitral proceedings. A mediation may be concluded within one or two months or faster, depending on the parties involved. But I mean, I, I just wanted to add that mediation may be less suitable when in several cases, for example, like uh, when a fundamental principle is involved, which requires judicial determination to set a precedent or to interpret a legislation, for example, a civil rights matter, um, when um, a, an emergency protective relief such as an injunction is needed, or when, when one party has clearly demonstrated its refusal to negotiate. Um, so maybe we can um, then move on to the Singapore Convention uh, that was heralded as you know, the New York Convention of Mediation. So Alex, um, what are the similarities between the Singapore Convention um, and the New York Convention for arbitration? Yeah, so the, the Singapore Convention, which came into effect in, in on September 2020, is actually is, is actually a treaty under the auspices of, of the UN to provide a uniform and efficient framework for the enforcement of international settlement agreements resulting from mediation. We call it the Singapore Convention because Singapore was the first country to ratify it. Um, it is a, a positive development for mediation of cross-border disputes. Uh, because it will enable settlement agreements reached by mediation to be recognized internationally. Before the introduction of the Singapore Convention, there was no harmonized enforcement mechanism. So the only remedy for a party who faced an opponent refusing to honor the terms of the settlement was to bring an action for breach of contract and then to seek to have the subsequent judgment enforced, potentially in multiple jurisdictions. So that was quite an expensive and inefficient process. So now with the Singapore Convention, the parties who have reached a mediated settlement will have a uniform and efficient mechanism to enforce the terms of that settlement in other jurisdictions in the way that the New York Convention does for international arbitration awards. The, the, the New York Convention has actually the potential to increase the appeal of mediation to resolve uh, international commercial disputes. The, the, the Singapore Convention only applies to mediated settlements of international commercial disputes, but does not apply to settlement of like a personal, family, consumer, uh, or employment dispute, um, which are settled through mediation. And so similar to the New York Convention, there are grounds for a court to refuse enforcement, such as if the party to the settlement was under incapacity, if the settlement agreement is not binding or is null and void uh, under the law to which it is subjected, uh, if there was a serious breach by the mediator of uh, standards applicable to the mediator, without which breach that party would not have entered into the settlement agreement, or if granting relief would uh, actually be contrary to the public policy of the of the contracting party. Um, and I guess uh, with treaties, it's only as useful as as if there are as many uh, countries that have signed up to it. So perhaps um, Alex, you can discuss which countries have signed up to this convention. Yes, you're right, Erico. And actually, as of uh, January uh, 2021. Uh, so f f more than 50 countries, including China and the US, uh, have signed the Singapore Convention, but indeed only a few, uh, including Singapore, have uh, ratified the convention. And in particular, the EU and the UK have not uh, signed it yet. 
Um, so we've sort of um, looked at the enforcement of mediation settlements, but um, we might maybe just take a step back and have a look at the sort of uh, processes or institutions that might um, offer uh, administrative um, services for mediation. And one of the recent um, ADR developments between Japan and Singapore was the JIMC-SIMC Joint COVID-19 Protocol. Um, so this was an innovative protocol that offers a virtual or an in-person mediation that's administered administered jointly by the SIMC and the JIMC. So um, Alex, perhaps you can have a, a quick um, overview of what this protocol is. Yes, yeah, sure. So um, uh, as you have mentioned, the um, SIMC, Singapore International Mediation Center, and JIMC, Japan International Mediation Center joint protocol is the first joint mediation protocol between two international dispute resolution centers committed to provide expedite mediation during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it, it, it is actually a Singapore International Mediation Center, first collaboration with an overseas mediation center uh, following the SIMC COVID-19 protocol, which was launched in, in May 2020. Uh, and I mean, the, the, the background of that is that just the COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, has dis disrupted the performance of contractual obligations, massively disrupted supply chain and others, resulting, unfortunately, in multiple disputes around the world. And as I explained earlier, mediation uh, helps the parties to resolve the dispute in uh, an economical and effective manner. So that joint protocol is designed to ensure the successful settlement of disputes, which may be marked otherwise by physical, uh, cultural and language barriers. So, I mean, just a, a few things uh, to note about this protocol. Uh, mediation can be filed at either the SIMC or the JIMC, and both institutions will jointly manage the mediation. So, each center will nominate one mediator and uh, the protocol applies to all disputes, whether or not actually they are connected to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mediation can be conducted online, given the current limitations on travel and uh, settlement agreements may be enforced under the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which we've just uh, described in countries that have ratified the convention. So that, that many, but including Singapore. And this, this joint protocol came into force on September 2020 and, and will be in force until September 2021. So initially just for a year, but it is actually expected to continue uh, insofar as uh, parties will benefit from you know, a better access to mediation given the, the constraint posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I mean, the collaboration between Japan and Singapore makes sense. The, the two countries share very strong trade and commercial links. Uh, Japan and Singapore are among each other's largest investors. Uh, Japanese enterprises have set up key offices in Singapore. Japan law firms have entered into partnership with Singapore Law Practices, which shows the importance of Japanese investment in Singapore and the region. And, and, and finally, here we go, and both um, Singaporean and Japanese cultures uh, seems to relate well to mediation. Um, just picking up on uh, one thing that you mentioned, Alex, uh, you said that uh, both of the institutions can nominate one mediator each. So what are the advantages of having two mediators? Well, it, it, one of the main benefits is that, uh, you know, in a mediation that involves a Japanese party and a non-Japanese party, this co-mediation arrangement uh, allows for the appointment of of two mediators who are familiar with different background and cultural background. So for example, you can have one mediator uh, who uh, speaks uh, Japanese while the other may be an international mediation uh, mediator uh, specialized in like a specific sector. And, and really in practice, a successful settlement will depend very much on understanding um, the culture and, and bridging that gap, uh, helping the parties under understand each other's uh, perspectives. All right, um, thanks, Alex. Uh, so we've been discussing one set of uh, processes that um, you might find if you want to mediate a dispute. And one thing people might not uh, be that familiar with is the JCAA's um, mediation rules. 
So Nihei Sensei, maybe um, you could give us a quick rundown on the key features of mediation, um, of the mediation rules uh, of the JCAA. Sure. Uh, JC is a new commercial mediation rule took effect uh, just last year. And the new rules uh, encur encourage the parties themselves to discuss and agree on how to proceed with the mediation. For example, uh, the new rules provide options such as whether the mediator should suggest its proposal, or whether the time limit for conducting mediation should be set, or whether the remuneration system contingent on the conclusion of settlement agreement should be adopted. Also under the new rules, uh, confidentiality regarding statements during mediation is strictly pr uh, protected in the subsequent judicial or arbitral proceedings. This would enhance uh, frank and candid discussion, which is critical for a successful settlement. Another key feature is the enforceability of mediated settlement agreement. Uh, Japan is not yet a signatory of the Singapore Convention, but uh, the procedures under the commercial mediation rules are compliant with the requirements under the Singapore Convention in order to secure enforceability of settlement agreements uh, reached through JCAA arbitrations, uh, sorry, mediations. Lastly, uh, I'd like to highlight that uh, two thirds of over 200 listed mediators at JCAA are non-Japanese and come from over 50 different jurisdictions. The parties can of course appoint mediators who are not listed on the JCAA's list of mediators. But this is something I'd like to highlight. Ah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, and finally, are you able to share with us what the JCA's caseload is like for mediation compared to arbitration? Yes, uh, let me show the statistics. So this table shows JCAA's mediation caseload in the past five years. Uh, in Japan, a uh, court-led mediation is, uh, has a long history and has been heavily used, but institutional and international mediation has not been very active. So you can see that from this slide. However, JCAA has been jointly working with JIMC Kyoto to promote international mediation in Japan together. So uh, JCAA is hopeful that uh, their mediation caseload would increase in, in the near future. Yeah, um, looking at these numbers, um, hopefully uh, we see more uh, mediation cases with this JCA. Yeah, that's what we are hoping to see. <laughs> um, so that sort of closes our mediation section for tonight. Um, and we'll now move on to the amendments of the um, various arbitration acts. So one of the things um, that's uh, very much um, in focus in Japan is the proposed amendments to the Japan's um, Arbitration Act. So Saito Sensei, could you please take us through some of the proposed amendments? First, I'd like to say to ICDRO, ICDRO Young and International for this opportunity, and thanks to Emily and Erika, our moderators, to organize today's session. So the Arbitration Act in Japan was enacted in 2003, and it was based mostly on the 1985 Armstrong Model Law and does not reflect the 2006 amendments to Model Law. In order to facilitate international arbitration in Japan and modernize the Arbitration Act in accordance with the international standards, the Review Committee under the Ministry of Justice is currently discussing the possible amendments to Arbitration Act. And there are four, ma four major proposed amendments. The first, an enforcement of interim measures. Enforcement of interim measures was introduced by 2006 amendments to model law and says that the current arbitration act does not have provisional disregard. Under the current arbitration act, the parties can of course file a request for interim measures at national courts in Japan but the parties specific are to resolve the dispute by arbitration without going to the national courts. And if we have to go to court anyway to enforce interim measures, it would undermine the great intention of the parties and hinder the effective and efficient functioning of international arbitration. 
So the Peru's amendment largely adopt Article 17 and 70A to 70I of the 2006 model law, except for the application for preliminary order, which is ex parte proceedings um, in Article 70B, C, E. Um, so proposed amendments include uh, provisions such as the conditions for granting interim measures and the grants for refusing the enforcement of interim measures as provided in 2006 model law. To enforce into measures issued by an arbitral tribunal and the same level as the enforcement of the final award, the parties have to make an application at the national courts to obtain their enforcement order. The second, uh, the enforcement of mediated settlement agreements. In order to respond to the recent high demand for giving a enforceability to the mediated settlement agreement, in the commercial dispute, as discussed previously, and to be in line with the expected exit into the Singapore Convention near the future, the provisions regarding enforcement and mediated settlement agreements are proposed. The committee is discussing, among others, um, whether the mediated settlement agreement has to be international and commercial in order to be enforceable as provided in the Singapore Convention whether to adopt an opt-in method, that means whether the party to the settlement agreement have to specifically agree to the enforcement of such settlement agreement. To enforce the mediated settlement agreement in the same way as the enforcement of the final word, the parties have to make an application at the national courts to obtain the enforcement order. The third, the jurisdiction of the courts concerning arbitration procedures. In order to achieve appropriate and efficient proceeding at the national court concerning international commercial arbitration, which often require high expertise and language skills, the committee proposed to establish specialized divisions at the court by finding concurrent jurisdiction, parallel jurisdiction at the Tokyo District Court and Osaka District Court. Uh, Fourth, um, no requirement, no requirement of submission of full Japanese translation to the court. While it is common to conduct arbitration in English and all documents are prepared in English in the arbitration, if the parties bring the matter to the court in relation to arbitral proceeding, they have to submit Japanese translation of their submissions. This requirement was a huge burden for the party to the arbitration. So in order to facilitate efficient proceeding in the court, the, the committee proposed amended provision not to require Japanese translation of evidence and the final word or tribunal's order of interim measure in case of seeking enforcement of order by the court to a certain extent. So these are the major points of proposed amendment to arbitration act. Hi, um, that's very interesting. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, one of the um, other jurisdictions that has recently amended the um, Arbitration Act is actually Singapore. So Alex, perhaps you can uh, take us through very quickly um, at a very high level because we're running out of time, the key amendments that were, um, and, uh, were amended in the Singaporean Act. Yes, sure, Eriko. Um, um, actually, there were two key amendments, uh, the express power to enforce uh, confidentiality obligations, and uh, second, the default mode of uh, appointment of arbitrators in multi-party situations. Uh, so on, on confidentiality, very briefly, uh, under Singapore law, there is already an implied duty of confidentiality um, to the effect that neither party to the arbitration may disclose details of the cases. Uh, of the case to third parties um, uh, and express confidentiality obligations also exist in many uh, arbitration rules such as uh, the SIEC. But the Singapore Act now provides an arbitral tribunal and a court with express powers to make orders or give directions to enforce any existing obligation of confidentiality. So the Act does not create uh, any um, express obligation of confidentiality but uh, it provides express powers, which will make it easier for the parties to enforce uh, existing confidentiality obligations. Um, Saito-sensei, can you um, uh, uh, briefly explain uh, the position in Japan about confidentiality? The Japanese Arbitration Act does not impose express obligation of confidentiality 
But in practice, it is understood that the arbitration proceeding should be conducted on a confidential basis unless otherwise agreed by the parties. Thank you. Um, just in the interest of time, we might just skip the default mode, mode of um, appointment of arbitrators in multi-party situations, because I think uh, the other developments in Japan might be a bit more interesting for our audience. Sorry, it's, it's, sorry, you asked me to... Uh, uh, sorry, so, um, so Anne-Marie, you might just move on to the um, next section. Because sure. We have okay. 10 minutes left. Sure. Thank you, um, Eriko. So back to Saito Sensei then. Um, so as part of uh, Japan's efforts in promoting arbitration, um, what it did is expand the definition of international arbitration um, under the so-called Gaiben law to attract foreign attorneys, um, including arbitration specialists. And we mentioned that earlier. Um, but Saito Sensei, could you briefly explain what is a Gaikuku Hojimu Bengoshi or Gaiben? Gaiben, okay. A lawyer qualified in foreign country has to obtain approval from the Ministry of Justice and be registered with the Japan Federal Bar Association in order to practice in Japan. So, such approved and registered foreign lawyer is the Gaiben. We call it registered phone and lawyer, who is basically authorized to handle legal services concerning the law of the state in which he or she obtained a qualification as a lawyer. A registered phone lawyer may not handle certain legal services such as a representation in the court procedure. However, a registered phone and lawyer may act as a representative in international arbitration. Yes, that's right. So, um, and is it necessary to be a registered um, Gaiben to practice in every single area of law in Japan? Uh, no. So, to be adopted as, um, to be approved as a registered foreign lawyer, it is required to have at least three years of legal work experience as a foreign lawyer in the foreign jurisdiction or the person has a qualification to practice. So practice in Japan is not a requirement to be approved as a registered foreign lawyer. Um, this requirement of three years legal work experience was a huge burden who studied the career in Japan. So this issue is one of the major points of the amendment of the Foreign Lawyers Act. The Foreign Lawyers Act, uh, the official name is the Act of Special Measures Concerning the Handling of Legal Services by Foreign Lawyers, was amended on May 22, 2020, and major parts of the amendment came into force on August 29, 2020, last year. So before the amendment, a maximum of one year work experience in Japan could be included in the required three year period of legal work experience. In other words, a person uh, was required to have at least two years of work experience as a foreign lawyer in the foreign jurisdiction. The amendment enabled a maximum of two years of experience of practicing in Japan to be included in the period of legal work experience. As a result, it became possible to meet the requirements by having at least one year of work experience as a foreign lawyer in foreign jurisdiction. Yes, thank you. Um, how many guidance are there currently registered in Japan? Do you know? Yeah, as of January 1st, 2021, uh, we have 442 registered foreign attorney, while we have approximately 43,000 registered Japanese lawyers. Oh, it's quite a number. Um, it is. Yes, and um, so, what do you think or what does it mean generally for international arbitration in Japan, in your view? So the amended Foreign Lawyers Act eases the requirements for foreign lawyers to represent clients in international arbitration conducted in Japan by expanding the definition of international arbitration case. The old Foley Lawyers Act defined international arbitration case as a super arbitration case which is conducted in Japan and old uh, some of the parties have an address or a principal office or head office in foreign jurisdiction. Under this old provision, there is a problem 
that foreign companies that desire to retain foreign lawyers tend to avoid selecting Japan as a seat of arbitration because the law prevents foreign lawyers from dealing with the dispute between Japanese subsidiary and foreign companies. The new Foreign Lawyers Act defined international arbitration case as civil arbitration case in which a, a party to the case has a specific connection to a foreign jurisdiction. Specifically, this includes the case where even one party to the arbitration have head office in Japan, but its parents company, uh, meaning a person holding the majority of the issued share of the party has head office in foreign jurisdiction or 100% owner of the parent company of a party to the case has a head office in foreign jurisdiction. Or B, the governing law is a law other than Japanese law. Or C, the seat of arbitration is in foreign country. So under this amendment, registered foreign lawyers, uh, as well as actually non-registered foreign lawyers can represent a party in civil arbitration cases that meet any requirement of A or B or C. Yes, thank you very much. I, I see that is a that is a very complex topic topic which is um, currently um, also discussed in many events and uh, not only JIDRC but many others. So if if anyone is interested, please uh, register for such events and uh, participate. So as Erika said, we are running out of time, but um, I think there's going to be a Q and A um, from any questions the audience may have and. If not, we still have some reserved questions for you. Um, and so we did have one question that was um, answered on the chat or in the Q&A section, but I thought maybe in case people haven't seen it, we might ask it on um, on camera. So um, this was to uh, Nihei Sensei. Um, do the caseload statistics for the JCAA refer to domestic or international cases for Japan? Okay. Yes. Uh, so this, um, I wasn't uh, very clear on this, but uh, this the st statistics I showed today includes both international and domestic. And uh, with regard to arbitration, approximately 80% of the cases uh, are international. So I think uh, you can call JCAA as an international arbitration and mediation institution. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to type it in to the um, Q&A question box. Um, or if you raise your hand, you might be able to um, turn on, we might be able to uh, allow you to um, ask a question. Um, and in the meantime, uh, Smriti, can I ask you to launch the second poll? So, um, just uh, to gauge your interest, uh, we would be interested to find out whether you would be interested in knowing more about the Japanese or the Asian arbitration environment and market. Um, and then we'll look to uh, provide more further webinars throughout the year. And while that poll is also in progress, what we might do is perhaps ask one of our first questions. Um, so perhaps we can ask Saito Sensei, um, just in terms of the amended Foreign Lawyers Act, um, there's a provision regarding representation in international mediations. So perhaps uh, you, could you briefly explain what that involves? Yeah, that is the point actually I wanted to explain if I have a time. So, um, there is no provision of representation and international mediation in the Foreign Lawyers Act before the amendment. The amendment established a provision of international mediation case that can be represented by registered foreign lawyers as well as non-registered foreign lawyers. The international mediation case means commercial cases concerning a contract or transaction between business entities, which excludes consumer dispute, labor dispute, family affair dispute, and case where either a, a party to the case has a specific connection to the to a foreign jurisdiction or B, that governing law is a law other than Japanese law. So the latter requirement are in line with the scope of international arbitration case, but the first requirement is unique to international mediation as the Foreign Lawyers Act does not require that an international arbitration case be commercial arbitration. 
Actually, just briefly, since the results of poll two um, are out, uh, we're very pleased to see that uh, very, there's uh, very much, people are very interested in, in future events. So um, yeah, that would be something good to know for our teams uh, from Asia, not only in connection with this event, but also other institutional events in the future. Any other questions? Erico, do you have, do you want to go ahead with the, the other ones or? Um, there was one uh, question that we just received, which we might have like, we're just sort of going over time, but um, uh, the question was for a foreign lawyer to work in Japan, is there a specific criteria? But um, perhaps maybe we can just talk briefly about how you become a registered DJB in Japan. Right, so uh, as I explained uh, already, um, th there is no like a specific criteria. I mean, the, to be a guideman, as I said, they need to be approved by Minister of Justice and it need to be registered. But bear in mind that um, the registered for the lawyers and provides uh, legal service concerning the law of the state where they obtain the qualification as a lawyer. So they are not supposed to uh, provide uh, legal services regarding the Japanese law. I, don't, I, mean, I hope this would answer to the questions. Um, and each and, each and every individual application is very, um, very lengthy and complex anyway. So I guess it's case specific. Yeah, and um, well, yeah. Anne-Marie just went through the process, but it takes a couple of months and there's a lot of paperwork involved, which um, might not necessarily be <laughs> the answer you're looking for. Um, but if you do have any other questions, perhaps um, if you send them through to the ICDR, uh, we can uh, deal with any further questions afterwards. Um, so thank you everyone for dialing in. It was great to see um, so many people have dialed in on a Friday morning or evening or afternoon. And thank you ICDR again also for hosting. Thank you very much. From Asia. Thanks everyone. Thank you.